And so that led you to, uh, after doing that tour, that led you out of the city. Where'd you land next? Well, back in Montreal when the okay. tour was over. Yeah. Broke up with a boyfriend. Yes. And then I had wanted to work with this uh, director called Alex Hosfader. He's in Romania now, Romanian director, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ladies man, whatever, who came over to do Grotowski work. And right. so I did a show with him and I knew that if I was in the show, because all his shows were very, very imagistic and all the women always took their clothes off. So I knew if I was going to be in a show with him, I would have to go naked, and I didn't have a problem with that. So yeah. much of the problem with that is is um, is uh, cosmetic, mm -hmm. and so I, you know, I'd been to NTS, and they, you know, beat me into a, you know, a body, and I didn't have a problem. I was mm -hmm. 20, you know, yeah. so I did a, a, a play with him while I was still doing the, the children's theater, you know, in the city, mm -hmm. and oh, it was fantastic because. The images are still there, and I think some of the masks in Jessica and stuff, because it was highly imagistic, there were beautiful masks, mm -hmm. and at some point, I was supposed to be Baphomet, and he tried to make me gross, you know, like I was gross, and then I would take off this fur thing, was supposed to be my hair, which was someone's old fur coat, like stuck onto something, mm -hmm. and I would, t but he, he wanted me to scream and hate the audience, and I couldn't do it, I was too, much of a girl. Anyway, <laughs> and I would take off this fur coat and, and then turn into a, 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 a young girl with a mm. balloon. Mm. And that was fun. It was a transformation and it was fun. Mm. And then Lane Coleman, who I'd met on the tour, had gone out west to Saskatoon and he wrote me that there was a part for me. Mm. And I packed up my room, I stored my stuff and uh, got on the plane and went out. And I never was back to Montreal for more than a visit for years. Right. That's what it was. Yeah. What was the part? Do you remember? Sure. It was, it was Michael Ondaatje's Billy the Kid had come out. So this was not that, mm -hmm. but it was some other story, more like the Audie Mur Murphy movie okay. that had been written by Andy Tan and cribbed in various ways. And, you know, and mm -hmm. so I played Billy the Kid's girlfriend. Right. And we had another like, fantastic time, met all these great people. But they, they were drinkers in a way that I wasn't used to. Hmm. And I learned you had to join them and you weren't going to beat them. So <laughs> it was a western city bar culture. Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of interesting people around. And we were the young people's theater. And we had a working wage. It wasn't, I don't know what it would be like getting now, $300 a week, maybe something like that, maybe mm -hmm. four, probably mm -hmm. less, three. And, and I lived there and worked there for two or three years. Yes. Having the most, I mean, I was always scared. I was terrified of bad reviews. I was always scared. Mm -hmm. But I knew that this was incredible. Like, I knew that the chance to be working with a young company and getting paid to do it, away from everything that was the East to me. Mm -hmm. It was Montreal, it was my family not wanting me to do this and not supporting what I was doing. And it's hard to go against your family, you know? Mm -hmm. It's hard to go against that. Even my mom, who was always on my side, just mm -hmm. nobody got it. Eventually, did they ever? Well, when Maggie and Pierre happened, they had an easy time of it. <laughs> was you know? it Sometimes I think a little too easy. I'd like them to see them kind of had to struggle a little longer. But when your face is plastered everywhere and yeah. you're just like, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. My father still would tell me what a good school teacher I would have made when I was like in films <laughs> everywhere and stuff like that. It's just like, oh. Dad, yeah. yeah. Really. Yeah. But... Um, because to him, in working class England, the, the, the smart girl was a school teacher, and that was it. That is yeah. the level that you reached. Yeah. However, that was 1930. <laughs> so, so, yeah, and, and one of the times I went back, we, we named a play, If You're So Good, Why Are You in Saskatoon? Right. Partly because when I went back to visit my parents for Christmas or something like that, I could hear my parents kind of talking upstairs, and I heard my father say, what, what, what's she doing in Saskatoon? And I thought, right, of course, what, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when I got back, I said, yeah, it's like, if you're so good, what are you doing in Saskatoon? Mm -hmm. And that was our title for this show. And how did the show do? We were a hit. Absolutely. It was, we were a, a student hit, you know? Mm -hmm. We were the semi-pros and we, we just cleaned up and that was meeting Paul Thompson. Mm. That's how you met Paul Thompson, eh? Yes. Mm. So, Again, this kind of, 
I don't know, I think of us as sort of like <laughs> chicks in our little roost, you know? Mm -hmm. We had a roost, we had a spot. Mm -hmm. And we were, I guess, an interesting young company that, that Paul would, you know, would be interested in. He wouldn't be interested in aligning himself with the regional theater. He mm -hmm. was interested in what new people were doing and inventing. And all of a sudden, I was inventing stuff when I thought all I wanted to do, do was be a kind of dreamy Ophelia or a dreamy Juliet. I wasn't doing that at all. Mm -hmm. And he came out west to do the West show with his company and decided not to just take from the west because he was sort of landing with us and that gave him a spot and a, a space. Um, so he decided not to just be the Easterners to come out and steal from the west. He was going to give. Mm -hmm. So he decided he was going to direct two collective creations um, at once, which no one has ever done before or since. In the morning, he worked with his company, which included Eric Peterson, Miles Potter, Ted Johns, uh, David Fox, um, uh, uh, Janet Amos, Anne Anglin, and my friend Connie Calder as the young person. Mm -hmm. I think that's everybody. And then in the afternoon, you know, us. <laughs> and we had no idea, no, no idea. Making up a play on your feet, like what the hell do you say? Like where do you, what do you do? Like we had no idea. And, you know, and Thompson had this terrible cold and he would be lie there on his, on his side, kind of with his snot coming down. I mean, not, no, he was, I mean, he was sopping it up, yeah, but yeah, you know. Yeah. But and, and we were just like, I was blank because I was, I was otherworldly. I was living in a world of fairy tales and Tolkien and I was just very out there. And what Paul did was he grounded me and all of us, but especially me, in the interviewing with the real people, in looking at real circumstances. Mm -hmm. It grounded that dreamy part of me. Mm. And at one point, is this going on too long, Andrew? No, God, no. Are you kidding? All right. Soaking it up. All right. So, so. at one point, because we had no clue, mm -hmm. and the rehearsals were awful, painful experiences in more shame and despair, mm -hmm. we, he invited uh, whoever wanted to to come up and watch one of, one of the rehearsals of his company. Mm -hmm. And so I think Lane and I, and I'm not sure who else, went. And I've never forgotten what I saw. I've never forgotten it. It is the most, like they were all pissed off because Thompson had them in like a flea bag hotel on 20th Street because he wanted them to soak up the atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they were kids, they were traveling with kids. Mm -hmm. It was just, and so the atmosphere was very grumpy in the room. And um, he was using um, sculptor Joe Fafard's sculptures as a jumping off point for the improvisations. And so in the middle of this room was, um, was a, 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 like a little statue of two people, sort of older than middle aged, sitting on a couch and he had sculpted the couch, staring ahead like this. Hmm. And the woman had little slippers on. They were all sculpted. And it was in the middle and his company was kind of circling around this little sculpture. Hmm. And they all were pissed off. You know, and then and then all of a sudden, Ted Jones just starts. And he goes on this wonderful, wild monologue about how these two people were actually watching Diefenbaker's funeral. Hmm. And he did Diefenbaker's funeral. He did Diefenbaker. Hmm. He did the two people. He went on about the ramifications of what that meant to the West. I mean, he's a brilliant guy. Mm -hmm. And he must have gone on for 20 minutes. Meanwhile, pe the, the other actors are laughing hysterically. He just, and then he just stopped. And no one went, oh my God, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Then it was just stopped and they kind of sat back and then Anne Anglin came to the fore. And she was doing, I think, a Métis woman. Mm -hmm. And she said um, something like, um, my name is Marguerite Bourgeois and I'm four feet tall and four feet wide and I have a long black braid right down my back. And I swear to God I saw that braid mm -hmm. materialize down her back. She was so there, and she turned around, and I went, Phew. I saw it snake down mm -hmm. right, right to the beginnings of her, uh, the end of her spine. And I'm like this, and Lane too. I mean, she just mm -hmm. transmogrified in front of us, and she went on for a while. 
And then everybody's grumpy, especially Pearson. You know, they're all grumpy. That mm. Give us a scene. Give us something to do. And Thompson said, ah, something like um, Chekhov. And he's trying to get all these Chekhov people to join the farmers' union. They didn't get together in a huddle and go, you be so-and-so and you be so-and-so. Mm -hmm. Without doing anything, right in front of my eyes, there were these faux Chekhovian characters. Hmm. And Anne Anglin was on some chairs going, oh, I wish I could move to Toronto. <laughs> and, and, um, and Connie was going around with a samovar and, hmm. and Fox was pacing up and down with a, with a book, uh, hmm. you know, and, and, and I don't know, everybody had a, a, a character and they were all lounging around. It was Cherry Orchard, it was Seagull, it was all of them. Hmm. And then Eric Peterson was there trying to get them to join the Farmers Union. <laughs> <laughs> fabulous scene, mm -hmm. fabulous, with nobody, it just happened. Mm -hmm. And by that point, we were slayed. Right. We were slayed. Mm -hmm. And we went down for the afternoon <laughs> thing going, my God, these are, these are gods, these are giants and gypsies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they were just, and, and continue to be my heroes. Hmm. As far as inventing real material with real content, it isn't just picking up stuff from, from pop culture and refurbishing it. It's actual content, but it's also art and stealing and all kinds of things. So